we go. Cool. All right. Um, well, thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, we have as our guest of honor today, Blake Scholl, CEO and founder of Boom Supersonic. Uh, I'll give you a little background on Blake, and then um, I think we'll just do story time. Blake's got a bunch of great stories that we'll just kind of walk through. So um, quick background on Blake. He is originally from Cincinnati. Fun fact, he never graduated from high school. He's a high school dropout. He was accepted to Carnegie Mellon uh, a year early, and I think he graduated from Carnegie Mellon early as well, right? Yeah, and he went to Amazon when he was uh, a year early out of Carnegie Mellon and was there very early and uh, was one of the early people on uh, paid customer acquisition on the internet. He was one of the pioneers in that space and turned that into a huge deal for Amazon. They're in the late 90s uh, through the early 2000s. Um, left, started a company. Uh, that company was later acquired by Groupon where he's a, he was a VP. Um, and then he left Groupon to uh, start Boom. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, did I miss anything? You skipped over a couple important things. That we went to high school together. Yeah, I've known Blake forever. Blake's one of my oldest friends. <laughs> and uh, Avicii was my intern at Amazon. I was, I was gonna ask you who your favorite intern ever was. I was gonna see that, I was gonna tee that up for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, Blake and I go way, way back. Um, so thanks again for doing this. Uh, it's great to see you. Happy to be here. Um, so maybe we can just start with the, with the basics. Like, um, what is Boom? How did Boom happen? You know, just give us the backstory. Um, how did, what is Boom? So we're, we're building uh, supersonic passenger airplanes that uh, way more people can afford to fly on than ever. So think here to Tokyo in five and a half hours instead of the 11 it takes today. So if you've got a Monday morning meeting in Tokyo, uh, instead of having to leave Saturday, you can leave Sunday and sleep in your own bed the night before you have to go. So the, the, the long-range vision is uh, to remove the barriers to experiencing the planet and let you live on Earth the way you say you live in a city. And that'll, that'll keep us busy for a long, long time. And I, I hope that 100 years from now, uh, our, our successors are working on the 150 millisecond transporter uh, because it's actually way better than the 300 millisecond transporter. And if you stop and think about it, it really is way better at 150 milliseconds. That's hilarious. You actually have this great stat around uh, travel to Hawaii when, when the jet plane happened, which might, I think, be relevant here for people to sort of conceptualize what it means to actually be able to travel twice as fast. Yeah. I, so I think all the most interesting innovations in technology have their, their most significant effects in the second order. And so if you think about the, think about the smartphone, uh, you know, when Steve Jobs stood on stage in 2007 and introduced the, the iPhone, no one would have said, well, the, the real thing that's going to happen because of this is this ownership model of cars will ship to fleets and that'll enable Uber and Lyft and you know, eventually push towards self-driving. And like, no, no one predicts that. Um, and you know, crypto will be the same story. The second order of facts will probably dominate. And, and you see it in the history of aviation as well. So in the... Um, <clears throat> In the days before jets, a flight from San Francisco to Hawaii would take about 16 hours. Uh, and people would be like, oh, 16 hours? Like, eh, let's go to Napa. Um, and then in the first 10 years of the jet age, when those flights shrank from 16 hours to more like the six or seven that it is today, travel to Hawaii went up sixfold. Uh, and it kept on growing for the next few decades as people started to build you know, hotels and resorts and tourist attractions like now geared around uh, Hawaii being more accessible. Yeah, and this is one of those, um, you see this in popular culture too, right? Is in the 50s, like the Brady Bunch, that era of television, you would have episodes in Hawaii because going to Hawaii was this exotic, far-off place that most people would never be able to experience. And you sort of saw like the decline of that through the, through the 70s and the 80s when it just wasn't so crazy to be able to go to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, so how did Boom actually happen? Like, did, you, did you just wake up one day and say, I'm going to build a plane? Uh, so, so truth be told, Avicel was the very first person on the planet who told me this was not a bad idea. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Uh, but in a, in a way, the story goes back to 2007. So the year the iPhone came out, and I think it was October of that year, uh, the, the girl I was dating at the time was stuck on one of these like, horrifically delayed flights, like three hours late. And while I'm sitting there waiting for her, I started wondering, like, whatever happened to high-speed flight? Um, and so I Google it, and I still have this rant I wrote about like how much life would be better if she, uh, like we could only seen each other at Mach 2. Um, and uh, I put a Google alert on supersonic jet that day because I wanted to be first to know when I could go bust the sound barrier. And it was, it was like 10 years of crickets. Um, like no credible effort to build something I could ever see myself or my friends and family and loved ones flying on. Um, and you know, meanwhile, kind of had the, you know, the second half of my internet career and started a company and sold it to Groupon. And uh, there's nothing like working on internet coupons. <laughs> uh, 
uh, to make it your own to work on something you love. But the, the, the Groupon acquisition money became the seed, seed capital for Boom down the road. Um, and, uh, and so about, about five years ago, I quit Groupon and started thinking, you know, there's, there's no such thing as an easy startup. Like, you guys all know that. Like, it's freaking hard. And uh, no matter what you pick, there's going to be tough times. And so, you know, I thought back to the decision to sell my first company to Groupon, which came down to uh, the offer was worth more than, like, the pain I was going to go through to keep the company going because I just didn't believe enough in what we were doing. Hey, so I have a couple of questions. One is... So back when con concours were flying, that was way before it was taking a lot of time to get to the airplane from the entrance to the airport, right? So do you, th do you think at, at all about how you can streamline that process? Is it, is it part of your thinking? And with that question, again, in concords, every seat was considered to be first class. Is it the same in Boom Supersonic, or do you have like a wall with like people and then everybody else behind? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so first class versus second class in the airplane, I'm sorry, you remember what the first part of the question was again? The time to... Uh, oh, the time to get to the airport, yes. Um, so so uh, the original business plan for Boom had us being an airport, an airline, and an airplane company because I couldn't stand thinking of like this problem only in some nuance of it. But it turns, I mean, obviously that's like way too much scope in one go. Um, and so the way, the way I think about that is you know, today when airplanes are slow, the entire ecosystem is kind of geared to the same pace. And so how are airports designed? They're, they're like shopping malls because they're designed for you to spend a lot of time there. And in a, in a world where flights are high speed and it's about conquering the planet, um, all the incentives in the ecosystem around you change. And we'll need, you know, we'll need the help of other partners to, to stream air, streamline airport security and change the way uh, airports are built. And so we, we see our, the role that Boom has in this is really the bully pulpit. And so you know, over the next few years, you'll see us like, come up with concept videos of how air, airports really ought to work and how security really ought to work. And we're not going to go do that stuff ourselves, but we'll hopefully like, prod other people. Uh, to kind of go and go and work on this stuff because the, the shorter the flights are, the greater the pain point of the ground transportation and the airport experience. Um, and you know, and my my hope is that you know down down the road you'll take your uh, you know EV toll aircraft to the Hyperloop station and that'll whisk you like directly to the departure gate of an airport that's maybe not even in the city limits anymore because it with if you fast enough ground transportation it can be further out and then you board your you board your supersonic jet and you get to the other side of the planet. Um, so second question, the class on the airplane. So uh, for transatlantic, it's a single class airplane. Uh, we, we describe it as all business class because the seats are, um, you can go see these pictures on our, on our website. Uh, but it's, it's kind of all business class style, but it doesn't lay flat because on a three hour flight, like by the time you get the seat down, it's time to put it back up. It's just, it's just silly. Um, and by the way, that's part of how you make the business work is uh, you're replacing lay flat beds with, with nice size seats. And that's like a factor of two. The, of your passengers you can put on the airplane. Um, and, but somewhere, you know, somewhere between four hours and seven hours, people start wanting lay flat beds and there's a certain market that'll pay a premium for it. So we have a, we have a first class version of the product as well that, you know, for example, you know, Sydney to LA, it'll be seven hours and you'll be able to go to sleep in Sydney and wake up in LA and it's gonna be pretty cool. Uh, you mentioned Sydney to LA in seven hours. Uh, where do you see the next Hawaii being? I would imagine uh, many places in the world or some places in the world have the social and political foundation to have flourishing economies, but maybe they're a little bit remote. Um, where would you see this type of, of a hockey stick um, you know, uptick in, in economic formation? Man, it's, uh, it's hard to predict exactly. Um, th th these are the kinds of things that will surprise you. Uh, but, you know, I think of uh, Sydney today is like Honolulu without a jet. And, um, and so, you know, I, th I think, you know, Australia and New Zealand that are just really suffering from the tyranny of being far from, like, the rest of the freaking world are going to disproportionately benefit from this. And I, I see that being tourism. I see that being business. Um, uh, yeah, Tahiti is actually the ref uh, you have, We have to just stop for gas from L.A. to Sydney. The seven hours includes the refuel, and we'll do that in Tahiti. And of course, the trick will be to like have the passengers not get off the jet in Tahiti. <laughs> um, yeah, Fiji again, like yeah, where are the corners of the world that are like really exotic and cool, but like too much of a pain in the ass to get to? 
Uh, and then there'll be some other other effects that are interesting, like you know, um, Hong Kong to Tokyo. Today, that's a four-hour flight. And uh, what if it turns into two hours? It's like a shuttle, and you can actually commute between Hong Kong and Tokyo. What does that do? Uh, first of all, thanks. This is a really insightful talk. Uh, secondly, so. I don't know, I guess analogous to crypto, sort of your tail risk is catastrophic, right? And then how you outlined is effectively, it's a lot of execution risk. So I'd be curious to learn more about sort of the value and the culture you're trying to build from day one and sort of the operating principles you're really trying to follow since and also how that has manifested and changed over time and sort of the lessons you learned from that. Um, sure. So kind of culture and company and lessons learned along those lines. So it was, um, a method of thinking I find very helpful in this is um, uh, what I call reverse historical reasoning, uh, which I really need to coin a new name for. Um, but the, the, here's the idea. Uh, imagine yourself in the future, and the year is like 2040 or 2050, and you're, uh, you're reading the history books about how the world made the transition from subsonic to supersonic. And just you know, take everything that we all know from the history of business and tech and the environment we swim in and the success stories we're familiar with and say, well, how do you think that story goes? Well, do, do you think it's like after a century, Boeing got off their butt and did it? I mean, probably not. That's probably somebody from outside the industry. And you know, what, would the, what would the attributes of their story look like? Well, um, they, they have to be highly perseverant because people are going to call them crazy. Um, uh, they'll have to, uh, what they're doing is technically hard, and so they'll need a team that's both brilliant and committed very long range, uh, a, a team that'll you know, see it through for the, like, basically the decade that it'll take from you know, founding to really having success. Um, and uh, and you know, as you start to fill out that story arc, you find that your intuition brings you a lot of the things that are gonna be the key elements of success. Um, and if, you, if you're forgetting that like, you're part of this, like, you can divorce your ego from it, and you can divorce, your, you know, divorce yourself from your insecurities about what you, what you personally think you can and can't do. Um, and then, and then, then you look back at this, this story arc and you say, well, that's called my strategic plan. And uh, now I get to do my best to live into, um, uh, live into that success story. But so one of, the, the, one of the elements of that, coming back to your question, that was evident from you know, the moment of founding was that team and culture were gonna be paramount. And, um, and we wrote our uh, we wrote our first culture doc when it was a two person company, and we were very deliberate about what we thought made for good hires. Um, and we looked for uh, we looked first and foremost for like strong, strong, strong mission alignment. And I, I tell to this day every single person who interviews with the company, like. Um, don't come unless you really, really, really believe in the vision. Uh, unless you personally really want to make supersonic flight mainstream. Because if you don't, and you're sane, you're going to give up along the way. This is really hard. And, uh, and some people actually opt out at that point. As, as cool as supersonic jets sound, it's not actually for everybody. Um, and so you filter for a high degree of mission alignment. And uh, we filtered for people who, in the early days, we filtered maybe too strongly for people who loved airplanes. Uh, and, we, and we looked for people who were you know, first principles thinkers, who could understand the why. Um, and you know, if you didn't know the why, if you didn't get hired, my, my favorite interview question was, teach me something. And if you couldn't teach me something, you didn't get a job. Um, and, and for the most part, that has served us really, really, really well. Uh, if, I, if I say what are some of the lessons learned, uh, some of those early cultural definitions uh, allowed us to inadvertently pick up some anti-diversity bias. Uh, you know, so for example, we had uh, in the early days we said we look for people who are builders, and that meant like you got something cool in your garage, uh, you're hands-on. You know, we hired uh, hired somebody who had um, held the world record for the fastest electric pickup truck uh, that they built himself. Uh, we had two people who had built their own computer-controlled milling machines in their garages, and and it was like super cool. And then we realized at some point, like that's uh, that's an experience that, that that's a filter that like accidentally overly selects for men, um, and uh, and we were missing out on some good people because of that. And so we we fixed that, and we realized like, well, why do we care about the builder thing? Well, actually, it's, it turns out the builder thing is a proxy for people who take initiative. 
Because you don't want people who are kind of nine to fivers, you kind of turn, you know, turn the crank and they do what they need to do. You want people who are like overflowing with productive energy, so much so that they go build stuff in their own time. Um, but it turns out when you, when you have that perspective on it, you look for a lot of other signs of taking initiative. And, um, and so we, we ended up changing the focus to be on that. And then uh, we've still got more work to do on diversity. It's, it's tough. Uh, but we, we bumped and turned the corner on it at that point. That was, that was one of the biggest lessons learned in culture building. Thanks. So thanks for the talk. Very interesting. So I have two questions. First of all, maybe you have answered it to investor many times. Can you give a quick comparison between XB1 and the Concord and the Soviet to 144? What makes it boom and your customers believe XB1 will succeed? and do better than, than the other two, from both technically and economically. Especially economically, so XB1 will only carry 55 passengers, much less than Concord, right? So how do you make money for the airlines? More expensive air tickets? And uh, what's the expedition, uh, estimation of the price if we cross Atlantic in XB1? Uh, second question, so you mentioned in your last part of your talk, you mentioned uh, Actually, everybody is looking forward to a supersonic passenger flight, uh, airplane. Uh, the passengers, airlines, and even capitals are looking forward to that. Why uh, Boom does it? Why Boeing and Airbus do not do that? Thank you. Cool. So um, uh, first question is, why is this better than Concorde? And second question was, why doesn't Boeing and Airbus do this? Um, so uh, what's, what's different is like we're Concorde with a business model <laughs> that works. Uh, and so, by the way, to be clear on, on terminology, XB1 is our prototype. So that's the um, uh, one-third scale thing that'll like look like a, fly, a fighter jet but fly like an airliner. And then this this guy uh, is Overture. So this is the 55 seater. So if, if you look at the the business uh, dynamics around this, um, so Concorde was a hundred seat airplane, and in today's money it was twenty thousand dollars for a round trip ticket. And you just can't find 100 people who want to spend 20 grand to go somewhere. And so the, the seats would fly mostly empty. Uh, in the airline industry, there's this thing called load factor, which is percentage of the seats that are filled. And it's, um, if you go build a, a you know, spreadsheet model of an airline business, you find that like, that's the thing that matters more than anything else. So you know, when, when a seat flies empty, it's like perishable goods. Like it's zero dollars. Like even getting a buck would be better than zero. Um, and, and so Concord at $20,000 a seat, uh, with 100 seats to fill, ran you know, uh, until they announced it was shut down uh, and everyone wanted to go. Uh, it was running at about a 25% load factor. So it's like you're buying your seat and the three empty ones next to you. Um, and uh, for that reason, it barely worked New York to London. So British Airways did make money on uh, New York to London, but it would not have worked on any other route on the planet. Uh, and so there's just no economy of scale. It's a specialized fleet of an aircraft. So if you say, well, what do you, what do you have to do to fix this? Uh, fundamentally, it's two things. Uh, number one, you got to improve the fuel economy of the airplane uh, because that was the big driver between behind the high fares. So you got to get the fuel burned down such that the cost profile looks more like subsonic business class, which we know is a price point that people are willing to pay. You know, think like five grand round trip New York to London, um, uh, and then. Uh, and then you got to right size the airplane so that the airlines can get a good load factor, not just on you know, the most common routes, but on hundreds of routes around the planet so you can get some economy of scale. And so the, you know, the way we think of this is uh, uh, let's think about you know, the, the larger you know, Boeing and Airbus aircraft, 777 or 787, and you just chop off the front part of the airplane <laughs> and make it go really fast. And so, you know, that's 55 to 75 seats, you know, on a 787 or 777, depending on exactly how the airline sets it up. And uh, we're at that price point. So if you can fly those airplanes and fill the seat and make money, um, then, uh, uh, then you can do the same thing supersonic on the same routes. And now, now there's a market for 1,000 to 2,000 airplanes uh, instead, of, uh, instead of like 14, like Concorde. Uh, on the, the why Boeing and Airbus don't do this, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, but to, uh, to, to summarize it, it's an innovator's dilemma situation. Uh, they have to go after the biggest market with the least risk, and they can't cannibalize their own business. It's a very, very special large company that's willing to eat its own businesses. And, uh, and so Boeing is, you know, I would say they're technically capable of doing this, uh, but they're not strategically capable. 
Like if you're the CEO of Bowen and you pitch this to your board, instead of doing a bigger opportunity that's less risky, you get fired. I think to, you, you'll know the numbers better than I will, but to put some numbers on it, it's, do you know what the backlog is on seven, 787 Dreamliners versus the total market size for Boom? If, if I remember correctly, it's something like Boeing today has 1,500 to 2,000 like back order. They just need to build those planes and, and the airlines want them. And that starts to butt up against the total market size for Boom. So if you put on your, your CEO hat, your CEO of Boeing, how do you go to your board and how do you go to the stock market and say, hey, we're not going to do this thing and we already have the, the, the planes booked and the airlines want them and, and there are probably a lot more planes to build on the other side of that. And by the way, we already know how to build those planes that are approved and we just have to manufacture them. Instead, we're going to go after this thing where we haven't even built the plane yet. And so you have a very, very classic innovators dilemma of like smaller market, more risk versus bigger market, less risk. And so you just can't justify it. I don't know if I got the numbers right, but... Yeah, the, the narrative is correct. And it's, you know, on the order of 1,300 to 1,500 units for the Dreamliner. And then the next thing they're doing, the 757 replacement, they're kicking around, you know, 4,000 to 5,000 units. So th this, is, this is a perfect example of a business that looks like a horrible idea if you're a big company. It looks like a great idea if you're a startup. I was just going to say thanks. I unexpectedly learned a lot about selling today. Uh, one thing I don't understand or would like to learn more about is these first six engineers. You kind of not really in the space, come with this crazy idea, say, hey, come and join my basement. Um, and they're like a big companies, like how, I understand big vision, but like how do you close these people? Um, with, how do you close these people? With great effort. Uh, and yet you, you have to find the special souls uh, who, will, who will go do this. So I, I can tell some of the stories of the first couple employees. Uh, so there was, um, I think I mentioned earlier on that I had sort of done this like recursive search process. And the, uh, the very first intro I got, um, I, I literally knew nobody in aerospace. And the best thing I had was um, a guy who had worked for me at Groupon had played uh, uh, hockey in college with a guy who now worked at SpaceX. Um, and so I took that meeting. And the only, the only cred I had was I could show up to the meeting in an airplane that I'd flown myself. Um, and, and I asked him, like, you know, who he knew. And, and I got five names, and, and so I met those, those five people, and um, uh, two, two of them now work at Boom. Um, and uh, the, the, the first one of those, I think I, I met very, very early in this process, and I, as he tells the story now, he thought I was totally batshit crazy. And uh, a year later, I'd learned a lot, and I'd hired, um, you know, hired my chief engineer, and uh, I went back and called him up and said, hey, I need a systems lead, and we talked again, and he's like, what happened to you over the last year? Because you know what you're talking about now. Um, and so he was, uh, uh, he was willing to make the leap. Um, our, our literal, so he was employee number two after the founders. Our literal employee number one uh, was somebody I started recruiting actually even before I found my, my co-founders. And it was, it was clear from day one that um, the, the big challenge in all of this would be finding the propulsion system that could work. Uh, and so I sort of started working on that problem in parallel with recruiting. And uh, I went on LinkedIn. This is, this is a business that like, could not exist without LinkedIn. Like, I found a lot of these people on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, and um, uh, right, so, uh, so I, I found this guy who looked like he had an up and coming career at Pratt and Whitney. Uh, who, what did you search for? Did you literally search, search for a propulsion engineer? Basically, <laughs> yeah. Like I looked, yeah, I, I was like looking at people who were like mid-level in their careers, who might, might be innovative, and like so I find I find this this guy on on LinkedIn, and I send him an email, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, uh, so so I'm starting a supersonic jet company, and I know you guys make some jet engines, and I'd love to talk to you and see whether there's anything in your portfolio that could work for our airplane, and uh, and the guy took my call. <laughs> Uh, and I think we like, during his commute, and I explained to him what, what I thought the thrust requirements were for the engine and whatnot. And I, I think he thought I was a total crank, um, and he never called me back after that. <laughs> but a couple months later, I get this text message from a number I don't recognize, and it says, "Hey, I'm in California. Uh, do you want to meet up?" And I'm like, "Is this like somebody I used to date? Like, <laughs> like, like what?" <laughs> Like, what, what is this? <laughs> and so I like awkwardly reply, like, who is this? And, and he's like, oh, it's Andy, the engine guy. <laughs> and and I, I read the biography of Elon Musk, and I decided I was done with Pratt & Whitney, and I want to go work on something new. Uh, and I, I actually just interviewed at SpaceX, and I, I think those guys, are already, like, those guys are no longer the thing you read about in the book. They've already passed that stage. 
um, and I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I said, well, if you want that, you should come work for me. And that was right around the time that I moved from Denver to Colorado. And so he, Barry sorry? Barry at Denver. Barry yeah, sorry. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and, and so he, he flew out to, to Colorado and he interviewed with me and my chief engineer in my basement. Um, and, uh, and eventually we convinced him to quit his like executive career at Pratt to come work with us. And as he tells the story, um, uh, as he's driving across the country, like with all of his possessions in the U-Haul, he's like, oh, crap, I really hope these guys aren't like a front for the Chinese government. You're just, <laughs> <laughs> he wanted, like, this, this guy had owned like half of the engine of the Joint Strike Fighter. Um, and, and he's like, what if they just want to steal the Joint Strike Fighter technology and give it to, <laughs> give it to somebody? <laughs> Fortunately, that wasn't us. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Learned a lot tonight. Uh, you mentioned that with jets, if something goes wrong, people die. With crypto, if something goes wrong, people don't die, but they might lose millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how you manage that risk it's not a move fast and break things kind of culture, I would assume. Well, there's move fast and break things at the micro level, so that when you when you build big things, they, they don't break at the macro level, um, and uh, and so there's just there's a tremendous. Um, I mean, you just you design in safety from day one. Um, you do you do something called a system safety analysis. Uh, where you look at, you build what's called a fault tree, and you say, well, what are all the ways this thing could fail? And you start from like the end reliability results, and you look at every single component in your system and how they can fail, and how they overlap with other pieces that can fail, and you percolate, basically, you percolate requirements from the top level all the way down to every individual component, uh, and then you test everything out the wazoo. And you, you, you know, you component test, and you um, uh, subsystem test, and you integration test the whole thing. Um, and you have to have a high degree of diligence. And in some ways, the regulations really help you with this because they give you, um, they're, they're sort of written in blood in aerospace. And like every single rule is there because at some point somebody done not that and it ended badly. Um, uh, but you have, to, you have to grind it out and then you have to have the right safety culture. And, and uh, a thing I've come to believe is that small teams can be safer than big teams. Because uh, when you're in a big team, uh, there's always the assumption that like someone else is gonna catch your mistake. And what you really want is an engineering team and a, and a test team where everyone feels that the buckle stops with them. And if they don't catch it, someone might die. Uh, and that, that results in not just the kind of mechanistic rule following that's a piece of it, but the like, let me actually think creatively about this. Um, you know, and the, the stories are not fully told yet about what's happened with the, the 737 here in the last couple of weeks. But um, it, it, this, from the stuff I've read in the press, it smells like there were too many people on this, and nobody felt responsible. So I don't know how that, how that translates for crypto, but in, in airplanes, that's how it works. You know, and then, and then uh, one other thing I'll say is there, there's some things that just end up being CEO decisions. Um, like we had to decide about a year and a half ago whether we were going to put an ejection seat in the first prototype. And that became a very contentious, very emotional issue for the whole company. And, and some people were hard over, like, you don't care about people's lives if you don't put an ejection seat in the airplane. And other people were like, it's a civil airplane. Like, we put ejection seats in things they get shot at. What, why would you do it here? And, uh, and after a couple months of you know, debate in the company, I realized this is a decision I have to make. And so I, you know, I jumped in, and I got three different test pilots to just go through all of our safety analysis. Because you, you can't analyze your way to this, but you can make sure your analysis is at least complete. Um, and then, you know, and ultimately came to the conclusion that, hey, we're in the business of building safe and reliable airplanes that we trust our friends and family to be on. And so why in the world would we, would we give ourselves a get-out-of-jail-free card in the first prototype? Because when we build Overture and it's got 55 seats, they're not going to be 55 ejection seats. And, uh, and ultimately explained that decision to the company. The whole company got in line behind it. And a really interesting second-order effect happened, which was all of a sudden there were like safety things we could do in the program that no one was talking about that suddenly became, uh, came to the forefront. Of like, why don't we do a third and final round of wind tunnel testing? And why don't we put a redundant airspeed probe on it? Because if you get the airspeed wrong, you're, you're, you're going to get kind of confused about where you're at as a pilot. And so we, we bought literally all the safety equipment that would bring home both the airplane and the pilot 
once we said, hey, we're not giving ourselves the get out of jail free. And then one of the uh, a thing that makes me feel really good about this is one of the pilots who helped us make that decision uh, afterwards signed on as chief test pilot and is you know, betting his life that, it, that we got that right. All right, I got, I got one for you. So uh, it's, it's become popular in recent years in Silicon Valley to think about full stack startups where, um, and what I mean by that is instead of just using the internet and selling a new technology to a provider, kind of an end, uh, an end provider, to actually full stack own that whole experience. If you have something very differentiated, don't convince other people and sell it, just be that end touch point. Uh, so I think like Open Door would be a, a classic example of this, where instead of building kind of a housing marketplace, they're actually touching the end consumer with the housing, you know, the buying and the selling of it. Um, that's sort of a canonical example. How do you think about the interfaces where Boom should live? Should it, you know, it's an airplane manufacturer, much in the same way that maybe like a Boeing or an Airbus would be, but should you or will you eventually move to be more of a full stack provider of transportation experiences? Yeah, so should we be full stack? Um, it, the, there's a very interesting history on this in the industry. Um, so uh, Boeing and United Airlines and United Technologies, uh, which is basically makes engines, uh, used to all be the same company. Uh, the industry started out um, w with the dominant model being vertically integrated. And um, it actually all got blown apart in the 1930s. Uh, with the, I think it was the airmail scandal of 1932. And, uh, and the, uh, what had happened was um, the early airmail routes were all heavily subsidized uh, by the post office. And so uh, basically United figured out that um, the, the public was paying less for postage than they were getting paid to carry stuff. And so they were doing things like mailing bricks because uh, they could they could make more money in the volume that way, and so and so the scandal breaks and it, uh, and and all, all, the industry takes the blame and the the uh, I think it was the like Air Mail Act of 1932 said that, well thou thou cannot have an airplane manufacturing company and an airline in the same business unless the FAA says it's okay, uh, and so the industry got split apart and like no one ever looked back. Uh, and now we've evolved into this world where um, there, are, there are different you know, stripes to the, the horizontal integration. There's, there's the airplane manufacturer, and then there's the airline, and then there's the, um, the, the airport, which is based, in most cases are like municipal functions. Um, and what happens is that the, the innovation at the intersection of those happens very, very slowly. So there's, um, you know, if, if you started from scratch and you said, how should baggage work? Like, there's no way you'd come up with what we have now. <laughs> there's just no way. If you stop, if you imagine you had control across the airplane and the airport and the airline operation, and you just think about this for five minutes, I'm sure that the group of people in this room would have a, a way better idea before, you know, before the evening's out. Um, but you, you can't, um, you, you, there's no go-to-market path today because the integration isn't there. Um, so I think there's I think there's tremendous value in vertically integrating. I think you vertically integrate over time down all the way towards all the consumer touch points, and then you vertically integrate upstream and, and the the key component technologies. I think propulsion is the most interesting one. Uh, but this is this happens at the level of decades. Uh, it doesn't happen out of the gate. And if you go uh, if you go try to do it full stack as uh, out of the starting gate, which uh, I tried to. <laughs> Um, uh, what you find is you can't get market validation because consumers are not going to like pre-buy tickets 10 years in advance. Um, you know, it's a good day when we pre-buy our tickets like two weeks in advance, right? Uh, uh, on, and on, on one hand. On the other hand, you have to convince investors and, and even more crucially, you have to convince suppliers. You have to convince the Rolls Royces and GEs of the world that, that you've got a product that there's a market for because they're going to invest like a billion before this whole thing comes to fruition. Uh, and uh, trust me, consumers want this isn't good enough. Uh, you have to have you know, credible demand, and then that demand becomes part of the capital story as well, because airlines prepay for their airplanes. So it, so it turns out, it turns out you, need, you need airlines and you need not too much vertical integration on day one, uh, although down, down the road, I think there's a case to be made for it. All right. Thanks so much. I've learned a lot. So 
Um, I'm curious about that first year from when you've decided that you were going to do this and your journey of learning. Um, could you just talk through how you know what how you went about that? Because there's so many ways you could do that. You could go and you know consult for Boeing and Airbus. You could read textbooks, do Khan Academy. You know, did you have a regular cadence with people in the industry that you were getting feedback from? And how did that work both on the technical side and as you kind of unraveled the economics of the business? Um, so that that first year, it was really organic. Um, I did a lot of journaling. Uh, I basically just wrote every day uh, about where I was at and what was the right thing, next thing to focus on. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time in my basement. Uh, it was it was it was also sort of just giving myself a year to like figure out what you can figure out here. So so I wasn't under that much time pressure. But um, but what, what I tried to do is kind of have a have a view of where my frontier of knowledge was, and kind of go at the parts that were like most needing of, of work. So, you know, started with the fundamental math stuff and then read textbooks. And when I, when I couldn't understand what they were saying, I'd go read a different textbook. And, um, and, and then I wanted to get you know, a certain amount of depth before I went and actually talked to anybody because on day one, I just had no clue. Um, and, and when I started to feel like, well, I'm at a point where I could benefit from talking to people, then I started to do that. Uh, and then when I was closer to actually starting the business, uh, I built the advisory board before I built the the company itself, uh, and so it was like, well, let me let me go find like people who are you know probably more senior than you'd ever have at this stage of the company, um, but but who can like support you in, in fact checking what you're doing, and then kind of lend credibility to the whole thing. And so we got um, uh, we got the former CFO of Virgin America to sign up as one of our first advisors, and he he double checked my airline math spreadsheet and you know, told me the assumptions weren't crazy. And he was right, by the way. <laughs> uh, that was that was really good. And we got the former head of Lockheed Skunk Works to sign up, and uh, a supersonic propulsion designer, and you know, a handful of other folks that were spanned. Uh, you, there's, there's some folks on the airline side and some folks on the technical side, um, and they all they all would you know kind of hand you your ass when you needed it uh, and set you straight. On, on stuff and um, uh, and then I, I think I, I think I mentioned earlier my favorite interview question was teach me something so even if we started to recruit that um, that lended knowledge I'll add something just that you mentioned I think from the outside looking in too that was really fascinating was I think the mindset was really interesting where you went in with the look this is probably not possible so let me just kind of I'm sure if I work on this for two weeks I'll just show that there's some math that means that this can't possibly be true. And I think it, it's from the outside, it looked like what that did was it, it didn't frame the problem as a, I'm going to spend a year figuring this out. It framed it as it's probably like two weeks to, to prove that this isn't, isn't possible. And then you learn a little bit more and you're like, okay, but it's probably just another two weeks to prove that this isn't possible. And, and chunking it that way also sort of, sort of like reframe the problem, I think, in an interesting way. Yeah, that, that's right. And qu quite honestly, I spent the first 18 months on this thinking, um, Today will be the day that I find out why this won't work, and uh, and I you know, like the there was a business model spreadsheet that I built in 2014 in an Airbnb in Hawaii, um, and I you know I thought for sure like someone was going to find the place where like the decimal point was in, you know not where it should be and the market's a tenth of the size I think it is and you know but after after like a year and a half or two years of this stuff getting pressure tested it's like well I think if it were broken we would have found out by now. <laughs> The oh crap! Now we got to actually go deliver this. All right, thanks, Blake. That was really fun. Um, I have a couple of just short rapid fire questions. One was like, why Denver, and if that was a net pro or con for hiring. Number two was you said you you hired your first engineer before your co-founders. Was that like weird or standard? And number three, I heard like the plane flips or something when you're. Is that right? Like you're kind of. No, or like I saw on the website that you're facing the other side when, when you're, maybe that's not correct. Okay. Okay. So, so sketch, not number three, but number one and two. <laughs> <laughs> we, we looked at one point at doing club seating and decided not to do it. And actually coming out here yesterday, I was on a triple seven facing backwards and decided I don't like that. So no, you face forwards. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the other rapid fire questions. Denver, Den Denver yeah. So uh, originally, I thought we were going to be in Long Beach because uh, there's the Boeing C-17 plant out there that's getting shut down. And I'd read the stories about Elon buying the Numi plant from Toyota and GM. I thought, well, that'll we'll just run the same playbook. Uh, but it, it turns out that everybody who um, wants to live in Long Beach already lives in Long Beach. 
Um, and, <laughs> and when I started talking with my first few hires about, well, uh, how do you feel about Long Beach, they'd, they'd get long face. Um, and, uh, and one of them was already in Denver. Uh, and I you know, kind of turned to the, this was like at the level of like the six people that were in the, the Sequoia offices. Um, I was like, okay, guys, well, would you move to Denver to do this? And they're like, well, sure. Denver is great. And so it was partially like low cost of living, low cost of real estate relative to like the Bay Area. Uh, but the, it turns out that the most important thing is it's a place where a wide variety of people are happy to live. Um, and, uh, and so you, uh, uh, you, you've got urban living for people who want that. You've got, if you want to have a, uh, you know, acreage and have a farm, um, you know, you live half an hour in the, from the office in the other direction. You can do it on an engineer's salary. I, I, I learned this thing recently. So I, I do these like breakfasts with different teams and just kind of get to know them better at this stage. And I learned that like half of our aerodynamics team, like the most mathiest, nerdiest group of this company, either grew up on a farm or has an orchard in their backyard now. Like, this is cool. You can't, you couldn't do that in San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, and so to, you know, where we stand today, 80% um, uh, of the company relocated to be part of it, and our offer accept rate's over 90%. Uh, so, so Denver's working. Oh, the other question was, like, was getting your first engineer or other hires before your co-founders uh, hard? Or? Oh, so, so it didn't actually literally happen like oh. that. Uh, I started recruiting like, in, in parallel, basically. And uh, and the the uh, my co-founder and uh, chief engineer joined, and then we hired the propulsion guy shortly thereafter. Got it. Thank you. All right, guys, that is time. We're, we're a, little, a little bit over. Thank you so much, Blake. That was fa Good fantastic. Yeah. And, and I just want to say, I mean, I want to say thank you in front of everybody to Avicel and the role that you've had in this. Uh, if, it, if it weren't for this guy telling me, like, go figure it out, dude, and, and being willing to be one of our very first backers when everyone else thought we were batshit crazy, we wouldn't be here today. So thank you so much for being a friend along the way. Of course. Um, it's, we, won't, we won't put this on the video, but it's actually um, a, a fun thing, too. So Blake and I have been friends forever. And um, one of the coolest things, I think, is uh, when, when I was watching Blake do the previous company and at Groupon, like the you could sort of like palpably feel how unexcited he was about what he was doing it was like yeah and and like as somebody if you've known somebody for a long time you kind of have a like a sixth sense for um when they're excited and into something and, and they're like happy as a person and so um i actually had no idea if it was going to work i didn't even look at the spreadsheet um like blake walked me through it once and i was like yeah okay i don't really i haven't done calculus since high school either like i, I don't know if this is going to work uh, I know nothing about the airline industry, but the thing that was so obvious was there was just this like spark in the person that was just like, oh man, you were born to do this company. Like there's, there's like nothing else on this earth. You were like put on earth to do this thing. And it was so obvious in like the first 15 minutes of a conversation that I was like, it doesn't even matter if this works, man. Like you just, you have to go do this. Um, and so I, I'm sure everybody has that experience with somebody in, in like when you've been friends with her for a long time, you're just like, oh, you were just born to do this. Like, you need to go do this. It doesn't even matter if it works or if it's sane or insane or people think you're batshit crazy. You just need to go do this. Um, so anyway, it was actually quite easy to say you should go do this because it was just so obvious. In, in retrospect, I feel less validated. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, you should, you should take that as, as commentary on me because I'm, I'm not qualified to judge whether a supersonic airplane is actually even possible. But I, I am. <laughs> I am, fortunately, uh, for everybody who is going to get to ride on one of these things, very qualified to judge uh, whether people are, are actually excited about what they're doing. So anyway, thank you again for coming. Thank you, everybody else, for coming. Great to see you. See you guys.